All right, welcome to Thursday Night Teaching. Hi, folks. How are you doing tonight? I want to welcome you in. We've been going through the book of Corinthians, and I'm repeating stuff because Paul is, I want to show you that Paul's after, you know, he's after something here in this book. He's bringing correction and change, and he's really pushing toward godly wisdom the whole way through. He's, he's you know, he's really after godly wisdom. It becomes apparent. He's correcting sin, and he's bringing forth righteousness. So, Father, I pray tonight that you help us to get what we need out of these lessons from the Corinthian church, Lord. I really believe you're pushing us toward godly wisdom. So I pray, Lord, that you open the eyes of our heart, open the eyes of our understanding, and grant us godly wisdom, Lord, scriptural wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm not going to go through, we, we went through chapter 5 where the man slept with his mother-in-law and Paul said, turn him over to Satan. Chapter 6, brothers and sisters are suing one another. All this is bringing problems in the church. And then Paul, at the end of chapter 6, I'm going to read this in verse 18. He says, flee immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have of God, you are not your own, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So Paul is saying, hey, the church, we belong to God. We are the body of Christ, okay? And he, he's actually, and he mentioned this already. Now he's talking about it again. This is very important in Paul's theology that the church is the body of Christ. The, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, in our body, and in our spirit, and we are God's temple. And that's why we should not be committing sexual immorality. That's why we should be, uh, have the mind of Christ and be following after Christ. And so then in chapter 7, which I am not going to go over, Paul talks about marriage and uh, gives some instruction there. And that's a whole topic in and of itself. But again, he was bringing correction and direction as the pastor and the apostle of this church. And he uh, talks about marriage in that chapter. And I don't want to go through that so much. So let's go on to chapter 8. Paul says, Concerning the things offered to idols, we know we all have knowledge. Listen to this. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And here he goes again. Worldly wisdom or godly wisdom. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. There's no other God than one. There are many so-called gods in heaven and earth. There are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, not everyone has this knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, now eat of it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food does not commend us to God. We're not better if we eat, and we're not worse if we don't. But beware, lest somehow your liberty becomes a stumbling block to another person who is weak. Here again, see, Paul is concerned about dividing the body. He doesn't care about the meat, whether they eat or they don't. What does he care about? Not bringing division into the body. He's going to give God's wisdom on it. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things too? And because of your knowledge shall, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience. Get, get this. You sin against Christ. How do you sin against Christ? Remember when Jesus appeared to Paul? What did he say to Paul? 
He called him Saul. That was his name. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You remember that in the book of Acts? Why do you persecute me? How was Saul persecuting Jesus? Brian, if I stepped on your toe, would that affect you? If I punched you in the belly, which I would not do, wouldn't that affect you, the head, your, your, your brain and your, your mind? If I, you know, grab you by the arm. Paul was persecuting the church. The church is the body of Christ, not metaphorically, but spiritually. Christ lives in every member. So when you sin against the least member of the body, you are sinning against Christ. You're not just sinning against Jesus, the head of the body, but you're sinning against the whole body. You're sinning against Christ because you've wounded your brother. So he says, hey, this is God's wisdom. This is the difference between worldly wisdom. I want my way. I did it, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. That's very worldly wisdom. I did it my way. No one tells me what to do. Who do they think they are? That's all worldly wisdom. It's not God's wisdom. He says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. Why? I don't want to sin against Christ. And that's, again, this is godly wisdom. It comes up again and again. In chapter 7, you had to marry your virgin because you didn't want to sin against her by keeping her in a, a, a betrothed state but not marrying her or by sinning against her, by burning in lust for her and not marrying her, you know, committing sexual immorality. You need to marry her to avoid sexual immorality or just to do the right thing. Chapter 6, don't sin against Christ by taking your brother to court. Chapter 7, don't sin against Christ by sleeping with your dad's wife. In fact, kick the guy out because he's damaging the body. And you need to kick him out because he's hurting people. Everywhere, you know, chapters 3, chapter 1, division. Let's get rid of that division. Why? You're sinning against Christ. Paul was telling them, don't let their liberty cause a brother or sister to stumble. This is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is dealing with a body. We all belong to one body. Where Paul is coming to that crescendo, he's moving right toward it in chapter 12 and chapter 13. He's moving to the hub of what he's trying to get across. That's why I'm emphasizing this as we go. So let's move right on to chapter 9. So he says, don't sin against... Um, your brother and sister, I'll just tap on this real lightly. And um, he talks about his right to receive offerings, but he doesn't even take advantage of that right because he doesn't want to uh, do anything to cause the gospel to stumble. I'll pick up with verse 15 in chapter 9. He says, but I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that they should be done to me. For it would be better for me to die then anyone should take this boasting from me. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. It is of necessity. Yea, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If I do it willingly, I have a reward. If I do it against my will, I have been entrusted with the stewardship. What's my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I preach the gospel of Christ without charge that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. And I could go on to the rest of chapter 9, but I'll stop right there. I, I want to talk about, did you see what he just said here? So that I do not abuse my authority. Even though Paul has authority, and this is not the last time Paul's going to talk this way. He's already said, remember, at the end of the, was it chapter um, 4? It says, do I come with a rod or do I come in gentleness? Now he's saying, I don't want to abuse my authority in the gospel. I don't want to take advantage of my authority. Everything he's doing, he is an example. He's doing to build up the body. Paul's not living for himself. Paul's not concerned about himself. Paul is not irritable. He is not touchy. He is not self-interested. He is not boastful. He's not proud. 
Paul is interested in the body of Christ because he has this revelation that everybody in that church is literally a member of Christ and he uh, doesn't want to hurt them, so he won't abuse his authority. He wants to use his authority for good. And that's how I always encourage the men, because you're the head of your house, your whole heart should not be to abuse your authority or to use it to feed yourself or to take selfishly, get your way. Your authority is there to protect your wife and your children, to love them, to cover them. Your authority is given to you by God to serve your family. I know many of you men, most of you men, go out and you work all day long and you bring the fruits of that labor. And I know women work too, but I'm talking to men here. And you bring it in to provide for your family, to buy clothes for your children, to support your family. And, and, and you do it because you love your family. We need to take that same love and not abuse our authority by being grouchy and grumpy and demanding. We really should be serving our fa family. Authority is always given, Paul says, to build up, not to tear down. There are times where you have, like you've got to spank your children. Here, here's a very good, very good way of looking at it. You've got to spank your children. You never spank your children to vent or let off anger. You don't discipline your children so you can vent your anger and call them names. And that's an abuse of your authority. You discipline your children to bring correction to them so they can grow up as godly children. Not to vent your anger. It's to correct them so they'll grow up into solid citizens and disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the difference between using your authority correctly and using it wrong when you're bringing correction. Correction is to help them not to release your anger. And we will pick up right there next week.